So if you're visiting with us today, my name is uh, Dave Parton. I'm the pastor here at Neighborhood Church, and um, you may have been here last week. We celebrated two years, and that was a blast. Um, this week, um, as we continue through the Thanksgiving season, um, you know, continue to pray for those that are traveling and all. Um, there's a lot of cool things going on. I'll share some things at the end of the service today. But this morning, I'm not preaching. This morning, um, um, in a second, I'm going to invite Jess up. Uh, and just let you guys know a few things about uh, kind of what's happening in our church. One of them is, um, one of my desires in starting a church is to have a church where um, everybody gets to use their gifts. And a lot of the churches that I've been um, to in the past, uh, you pretty much, you know, 50 weeks out of the year, you had, you know, whoever the lead pastor was preach. And one of my hearts was, what if, I, what if when we started church, what if there are people that have a gift of teaching, Right? And you find that in a couple of places in the Bible where people bring you know, their gifts to the church. And, and um, so what I did was I opened up uh, to some of the guys on the leadership team. If they wanted to kind of start uh, being on a, a kind of a preaching team with me. And so about you know, 30, 35 times a year I would preach. But then the other 15 or so, we would maybe have other people within the church that would, be, that would want to come and, and share what God's teaching them or what, they would, what God had put in their heart. And so we, just, we finished that up about a month ago. We had some guys go through. And this week, Jess is going to preach. Next week, we're going to hear from Curtis. So we're going to get over the next few months, hear some of these guys give uh, a sermon. And for many of them, it's their very first Sunday morning sermon. So it's exciting today to get to hear Jess kind of do this. He's... he's He's a remarkable guy. If you look at your bulletin, Jess designed that. He does so many things for our church. The, the, new, the Neighborhood Church logo he designed. Uh, he teaches our kids ministry. He teaches in youth ministry. So Jess, I can't go through the list of things Jess and Maria do for our church, but um, I'm going to have Jess come up and I'm going to pray for him, and then we're going to hear him um, give us God's word. Father, thank you so much for Jess. I pray for this time right now um, as he preaches, as he uh, heralds your word to us, that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts to better understand you and how our lives can be aligned to that and how we can love you more and love our neighbors together. It's in your name. Amen. Good morning. <laughs> All right, this is exciting. Um, thanks for letting me preach and and thanks, Dave, for giving me the opportunity to do this. Um, I'm, I'm preaching on the book of Job. Is it up there? Oh, yeah, there you go. All right. So uh, when, when Dave approached me about this and, and the other guys, we had to pick a, a, a verse or a bunch of verses. And mine is at the end of the book of Job. And as I was going through trying to prepare for this, um, I, figured, I figured out that I couldn't just start there. I had to kind of build up to it. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the book of Job. It's probably the oldest book in the Bible, and it's also a poetic book. So um, it's, ve it's a very old book, and it has like a, very, a lot of very ancient ideas that were uh, common to the area and common to the time of Job, but maybe a little bit unfamiliar to us. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of explain a couple things before we dive in. So, being a poetic book, it, so there's, there's history books, there's prophecy books, there's uh, the Gospels, there's letters, and then there's the poetry books. And so Job is grouped with, um, like, uh, Psalms and uh, Proverbs. But unlike Psalms and Proverbs, Job is just about one story. It's, it's 41 chapters of this one guy's life, Job. Um, people say... It's the most beautiful book in the Bible in the original language. And um, there's a lot of debate about the meaning and stuff. And, and the book is so complicated that we can't possibly get through even a small part of it. So we're, gonna, we're just going to follow kind of one idea um, this morning. Okay. So I want to build a little context here. And, and we're going to start with this idea that ancient people would have understood and Job would have understood at the time. And we're going to do that by looking at Genesis 1, verse 2. And it says, And the earth was out without form and void. The darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. So this, this is the beginning of the creation story. And this is, uh, what, this is what was before God created the world. Now, 
The question we want to answer right now is what did God make the world out of? Well, it's the, the form, the thing without form and void. And in the original language, I think it's, it's pronounced tohu vabohu. You don't have to remember that, but... <laughs> But it's this, it's this strange word that means without form and void. And, and in, in the verse, it continued, if we can go back to the verse. So it says, without form and void, that's the tohu vabohu. And then the darkness was over the face of the deep. This is the same idea, the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The waters. Deep waters, tohu vabohu, without form and void. These are all the same things in the mind of an ancient person. And, and we're going to sum it up with one word. We're just going to call it uh, chaos. So, so go to the next slide here. So, these, these are, so we've got to picture these all as symbolizing the same thing. And this is what was before creation. So this is the raw material God uses to create. This is what God makes things out of. This is the clay that the potter works with. This is, the, this is the wood that the carpenter works with. You know, God works with tohu vabohu, the chaos. He works with chaos. And he makes stuff out of it, and he makes good things out of it. Okay. So, in the ancient world, sometimes they would personify this. So they would make it into a character. Instead of just being chaos, it was a it was a character in a story. And this character was a dragon. And most likely it's a sea serpent. And so, so when ancient peoples would tell stories about creation, sometimes they would say, God fought the sea serpent and created the world out of it. Or renewed creation or something. So, so you can see, and it's, and it's similar to what happens in Genesis. That God sees the chaos, and he speaks a word into it and separates the darkness from the light, and he separates the land from the sea, and he creates the world. Well, it's, this, it's the same idea, except it's just a battle instead. It's, it's the god versus the sea serpent or dragon. Okay, does this all make sense? Am I going too quick? Okay. All right, so just keep that in mind, and now we're going to start into the book of Job. Okay, I'm just going to read from... Uh, Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all people in the east. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Okay, so this is, this is the introduction of the book. This is the introduction of who Job is, and we learn three things about him. We learn that Job's righteous, he's very wealthy, and he has a loving family. And so I just want to um, talk about each one of these. So Job's righteousness, it says that he was blameless and upright. And this has the meaning that he was complete and without defect. So he was, but he was not perfect. It doesn't mean he was a perfect man. It means that he was the best man there, there could be. And um, says he feared God and turned away evil. Job was also wealthy. He had all these sheep and camel and oxen and donkeys. I just want to say that each one of these animals represented entirely different industries at the time. So the sheep, the wool was used in textiles and clothing and linens, um, as well as being sold for meat. Um, the camels that he had, he had 3,000 camels. Camels were used for trade. The longest and most difficult trade routes in the world at the time were all traveled by camel. And so Job is importing and exporting goods from all over the world. Um, my phone uh, flipped on me. And then, uh, and then he has all these oxen, these 500 oxen. 
and that has to do with agriculture, and you imagine how many fields you have to plow if you have 500 oxen to do it. Then we learn, a, oh, and it says he was the greatest of all people in the East. So this is, this is the man. He's, he's morally and ethically upright. He's, he's wealthy, and his businesses succeed. And then we learn about his family, and he has seven sons and three daughters, and they're all grown, and they have their own houses and estates. And it says that whenever, it said each one on their day would gather, everyone would gather. That's their birthday. So every, every time one would have their birthday, all the brothers and sisters would gather at their house and they would celebrate. And this is what we know about the family. Okay. I'm going to continue reading in Job right where we left off and the, and the scene changes and we, and we come to a scene in heaven. And God is up there and he He's gathering the angels, and the scene is God managing the universe. That's what we need to think of this as. He's, he's delegating responsibility and just making sure the universe is run correctly. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. That's, that's the angels. And Satan was also among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down upon it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does, God fear, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went from the presence of the Lord. Um, so I just want to kind of go through this and talk about a couple things. Okay, so Satan shows up as the angels are coming to report to God, and this is, this is not common. So Satan's there, and God says, where have you come from? And Satan says, going to and fro in the earth, walking up and down upon it. And in, the, in his response, we, in, in how it's written in the original language, is a sense that Satan is like a predatory animal kind of looking for something to destroy or devour. In, in Second Peter, it says that Satan's a roaring lion looking for something to destroy. And so this is the impression we get here, too. That, and, and this going to and fro, back and forth, it's like a circling. Satan is circling. And I, I was reading a little bit about sharks yesterday. <laughs> and sharks will circle whatever they're kind of investigating cause, to try to see what it is. And so Satan is out there going to and fro, hungry, looking for something to devour, destroy. And so he's circling. And what's he circling? Well, God points it out. He says, have you, have you considered my servant Job? You know, this isn't God saying, hey, Satan, look at Job. He already sees that Satan is saw Job. And then Satan makes this accusation um, because God says, this is the best man in the world. Have you, I see you looking at him. And Satan makes the accusation, does he fear God for no reason? He, he bas his accusation has two parts. One, he accuses Job. He says, Job isn't really righteous. He's just protected. Like, who, who wouldn't want this kind of protection and this success? And implied in that is that, God, you're not really good, you're just powerful. And, and Satan's just purely driven by his hunger to destroy. Because if he could, like, he can't fight God. God's too big and powerful. So what does Satan do? He attacks what God loves. And so he attacks He's wanting to attack Job, so he levels this accusation. And, and God does something a little peculiar. He, let, he says, okay, and he removes his protection from Job. I um, just want you to notice that God's, God's up to something. He's, he, we, don't know quite, <laughs> we don't know quite yet what he's doing. Um, and, but it's a little, it's concerning that he would just take his protection away from Job. So Satan goes out and he destroys everything that Job owns and his children. So all of his wealth um, gets either taken or destroyed. Uh, his, 
his children, they're gathered at the older brother's house for his birthday during the family, big family celebration, and a whirlwind comes out and strikes the house, and the house collapses and kills his children. And then Satan also takes away Job's health. He breaks out in sores and has some sort of leprosy or something and stomach issues where he's in constant pain. So Job is ruined. He's ruined emotionally and physically. He's lost his wealth, his children, and his health. He has three friends that hear about this, and they go to comfort him. Sorry, I get a little choked up. <laughs> Just because the cause it, this story, the story is symbolic of the suffering that, you know, I... I see in people that I know, you know. Okay. So his friends, his friends come and they don't recognize him because he's just the shell of a man that he used to be. Um, there's a picture of him and his three friends. Job's, Job's just ruined, and they sit with him for seven days in silence. So Job speaks first, after seven days. And this is, this is what he says. Um, let, let me just tell you that we're into chapter 3. Now chapter 3 through, I think it's 38, 37. So like 35 chapters of the book of Job. Most of the book of Job is, it's all this poetry. And it's Job and his friends going back and forth, talking about his suffering. So this is... This is what Job says. Um, that night, the night he was born, oh, I, I gotta tell you, he's cursing the day he was born. He's cursing his birth. And this is significant because what was most important to the family? The birthday. That night, let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Behold, let the night be barren. Let no joyful cry enter it. <laughs> let those who curse it curse the day. Those who are ready to rouse up Leviathan. And Job does this throughout the whole chapter. He curses the day he is born. He wants to be unborn. He, he doesn't want his life to ever have been. <laughs> That's how great his suffering was. And this is where we, we pick up on this idea of Leviathan right there. And Leviathan was a sea monster. He was a chaos monster. He came from the deep part of the ocean. Remember what we're talking about the, from the very beginning? So it's the personification of this chaos. Um, so Job says, well, if anything can undo my... My, my life. Leviathan can do it. I want, to call, I want the priests of darkness to rouse up Leviathan so that he can take me out of history so that I was never born. So Job's friends are worried about him at this point. You know, this is some dark stuff that Job is saying. And they... They talk to him and they say, Job, we see your suffering. We see that it's great and beyond measure. And they start thinking about what's happened. Like, this is, like all these catastrophes happening at once is not a coincidence. So they're trying to figure out why God would do this. So they figure out that, well, God's just. So this must be some sort of punishment or he, God's trying to teach you something, Job. He's trying to... Uh, show you something, um, you must have sinned. You must have done something wrong. And they, they encourage Job to repent. They're like, if you repent, God's good. He'll restore you. He'll give you more than you had before. But you just have to confess your sin to him. And Job, Job at the 
hearing this, he's offended and outraged. Because he says, I didn't do anything. I don't deserve this. So he defends his innocence. He's like, I'm innocent. I didn't do anything to deserve this. And um, he fundamentally believes that he's being treated unjustly. Now remember that when Satan was said to God, Satan said, if you take all he has, he'll curse you to his face. Throughout all this, God, Job never curses God. But he does think God's treating him unfairly. And he, and he calls, well, we'll get to this other part. I'll just read it now. Here, here it is. <laughs> um, oh, let me just say, so him and his friends, they go back and forth throughout these, they do these poetic, um, these poetic speeches. And in the last speech of Job, he says this towards the end, Job 31, 35. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Oh, that I had an indictment written by my adversary. So what's an indictment? Well, it's a, it's a, it tells you what crime you did. So Job, at this point, is basically t- he wants God to take him to court and to, to provide an indictment that will tell him what he did wrong. And, and Job doesn't even think that he'll, in the court scene, he doesn't even think he'll be proven correct. He thinks God will bring something against him that's wrong. And he says, if that happens, I'll finally be able to have peace, because at least I'll know what I did. So, Job you know, the, here is my signature, let the Almighty answer me. That's like signing legal documents. And a fourth friend of Job's appears in the story and, and talks, and while he talks, a storm begins to build. And, and the storm comes, and God's in the storm. And it's, and it's God's turn to speak. And he says, um, in Job 38, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and make you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? God is not happy with this idea of having to indict Job. (laughs) And he's also not happy about the idea that, that, um, he, that Job thinks he's being treated unjustly. So, or more specifically, God, Job wants God to justify himself. And God says, says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? So, he begins to give Job basically a tour of creation. He, gives, he starts talking, and I'm just going to make a list, because God speaks for four chapters long. It's, it's a four-chapter poetic speech. And he talks about the earth and the universe, the foundations of the earth, the doors of the sea, the place of the dawn, the gates of death. Then he continues on to the stars and constellations, the storehouses of snow and hail. And then he talks about the animal kingdom, Talks about the lion hunting for excuse me. The lion hunting for its hungry cubs, the mountain goats giving birth in the unknown, the wild donkey searching for a place to graze, the wild ox's purposelessness and strength, the ostrich's foolishness and speed, the hawk and eagle making their their home in the mountaintops. Job wants an answer, he wants an indictment, and God instead shows him his glory. Now, the thing about God's glory is it's not, it's not rainbows and butterflies. <laughs> it's, it's rainbows and floods. Thank you, Dave, for giving me that line. <laughs> so God's glory is beyond understanding. This is what, this is what God's getting at. He, sa- he says, Job, you don't understand why you're suffering, but do you understand anything at all?
So God's glory is both terrible and wild and awe-inspiring and wonderful. And God shows that the world he made is a glorious world, and it's not a safe world. And it's a good world, but it's not one we can understand. And so Job realizes he was wrong, that this wasn't about punishment or justice. It was, it was about God's glory. So God continues his speech, and so he speaks for four chapters, and in the fourth in, in the in the fourth chapter, he it's entirely about Leviathan, this this chaos monster, the sea monster. I'm just going to read this. Job forty one one. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many pleas to you? Will he speak to you soft words? <laughs> Will he make a covenant with you or take or a covenant with you to take him for your servant forever. Will you play with him as with a bird or put him on a leash for your girls? Will traders bargain over him? Will they divide him up among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hand on him and remember the battle. You will not do it again. Behold, the hope of man is false. He is laid low even at the sight of him. In the next verse, God kind of makes Job eat his words says, no one is so fierce that he dares stir him up. Who is he that can stand before me? So remember when Job was wanting to rouse up Leviathan to undo his birth, and, and God just says, you're not fierce enough. You can't do it. And then God says, you know, the, the whole idea of this is Leviathan is the biggest and worst monster there is, and there's only one there's only one person that can deal with it, and it's God. So God continues describing Leviathan more and more, and the idea is, is that it all, like he's questioning Job, but it's, like, it's almost like a battle's going on. And finally, at the very end, God says, speaking still of Leviathan, he makes the deep boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. Behind him, he leaves a shining wake. One would think, one would think the deep to be white-haired. So, like, the shining wake, that's Leviathan going away. So, <laughs> Leviathan is gone. And Job replies, I know you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I have heard of you by hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And after, after this, God restores Job. God rebukes Job's friends for talking wrongly about God. And he says that Job spoke correctly about me. And so, Job was not perfect in his suffering, but he didn't sin, and he never cursed God. So, Job succeeded. He, God trusted Job to behave righteously, and he did it. So, so why, why did he, what, what was this all about? So let me try to connect the dots from the beginning. So Leviathan is the chaos monster, and he represents, he represents the chaos and suffering that overcame Job's life, right? So Leviathan is, is already had descended on Job with the destruction of his whole, with his children, with his family, with his uh, wealth, and with his health. And remember that chaos, that tohu vabohu, that's the raw materials God creates out of. Right? So when God talks to Job about Leviathan, He's talking about fighting against the struggles that Job's having, fighting against Job's suffering for the purpose of doing what? Creating something new. Because that's the raw materials God works with. 
Does this make sense? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's at this point like our, our modern minds kind of kick in and we'll be like, well, this is a nice story and all, but, you know, that why couldn't God just do something without all this chaos and suffering? You know, like, that's, that's a good question because it doesn't seem fair. And that was Job's whole point. This isn't just. This isn't fair. And God comes along and says, this is how I, this is, how the world's created. This is how I do everything that I do. This is the raw materials I work with. And so, so Job is actually a reflection of, or a shadow of another righteous man that was chosen to suffer, Jesus. So it's the same story. Jesus through his weakness, <laughs> through his weakness, took on suffering, <laughs> chaos, death, hell, and the grave. And why? He did it to make all things new. And that's, that's the hope we have, and that's what he calls us to. Being born again is about... It. That's what this is about. Job was born again after his confrontation. He was made new again. God restored him. Christ went down into death and hell, into the belly of the beast. You know, Jesus talked about, I'm going to give you the sign of Jonah. What was the sign of Jonah? Jonah got thrown in the ocean, and a sea monster ate him. <laughs> and then he was spit back up three days later. This is, the, this is the same story. And it's a creation story, and it's about God making all things new. All right, let us pray. God, thank you so much for your word, and thank you for this chance that I get to preach. I just ask that you'd help us um, participate in what your Spirit's doing, and to trust that you are doing good, and that despite all the suffering, despite the troubles, that that you are doing something good that will be that will be good. You're doing something good. In your name we pray. Amen.